All right, so Tammy Martin. Um, Tammy, you you lead bird, you've led bird trips up in uh, Point Pelee, I'm sure up in Ohio for with the um, Rocky River Audubon. Um, Black River. Black River Audubon. Black River. Oh, right. not Rocky River. Black River. That's all right. I knew it had a river in. Um, but go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit more. And then she's going to be telling us a little bit about her trip to Ecuador. And we're going to get to see some really nice birds, which I think is going to be exciting. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Susan and everyone. Thanks for, for joining us. Let me um, get my screen up here. Can you see anything? Yep. Yep, we got it. There we go. Okay. Um, oops, I don't want to do that yet. Back up, back up. All right. I am, um, I'm in Ohio. Uh, I live in Northwest Ohio. I'm a retired from um, Oberlin College. I was a library cataloger for I, well, I worked for Oberlin for 20 some years. Um, I was highly involved with our local county Audubon group, Black River Audubon. I also have been helping for 10 or more, 12 years with a Rhodes Scholar program uh, up based out of the, the Bass Islands and Lake Erie. So I've been leading some uh, local tours and uh, field trips and whatnot. Um, and uh, back in 2015, actually, I decided it was time to, I, I birded a fair amount of the US. There's some spots I haven't done yet. I haven't done any pelagic trips yet. I need to do those. Um, but I decided I needed to start some international birding. So in 2015, I went to Panama with a group um, Saber Wing Nature Tours out of Indiana. And uh, that was fantastic. And then two years later, I went with them on a trip to Ecuador, um, which was, again, incredible. Um, and then just less than a month ago, I got back from Costa Rica. So I've been starting to do a little more international uh, traveling and uh, I'm hooked. So I'm trying to decide where to go next. Anyway, let's uh, let's go to Ecuador. This is um, let me see if I can. Am I coming through okay, Susan? Yes, I assume. Okay. Yeah, it, you're fine. You're doing good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, Ecuador. Uh, oh. Before I go any further, this is Mount Antisana. It's one of the currently inactive volcanoes, the fourth highest in Ecuador. And this was the view from one of our lodges. It's just a fantastic uh, location, 18,700 foot mountain there. So, okay, why do we go to Ecuador? Um, lots of good reasons. It's a fairly small, about the size of Colorado but it has almost twice the number of bird species that you can find in the US, 1600 plus bird species. It's the fourth largest worldwide behind Colombia, Peru, and Brazil, which all three of those are much bigger than Ecuador. We'll see that in a minute. In a two week trip, you can get over 500 species. It's crazy. Uh, the lodges are good, food's good. Infrastructure is good. Lots of various habitats that uh, allow for a var the variety of, of uh, bird species that you see. You do have to remember it's on the equator. So the daylight is 12 hours. You have to get up and be out there by 6 a.m. because at 6 p.m. it's gonna get dark. You don't get the daylight savings time that we are fortunate to have up here in uh, temperate America. 
So um, you, that was one thing we had to keep in mind. And on a side note, they're the top, one of the top exporters of bananas and roses. How can that be bad? So um, let's see where Ecuador is for those that may not be, be familiar. South America, it's that little circled country there on the left, uh, on the Western side of South America, off the Pacific Ocean. Uh, surrounded by uh, Colombia to the north, Peru to the south. Um, Bird-wise, Colombia is the has the most diversity, followed by Peru, then Brazil, and then Ecuador is, like I said, is fourth. So if you're trying to get the best bang for your buck and the size of the country, Ecuador tends to hit all the all the buttons. And if you look to the right. Why is that? Because the Andes goes through from north to south. You have such a diversity of height, uh, elevation. You get different species on the west coast of the Andes or the west side of the slope of the Andes and the east side of the slope, all the way down to the uh, coastal plain to the left, to the Pacific to the west and the Amazonia to the east. So the, the habitat is just so diverse, it's, it's incredible. Um, the Northwest cloud forest, the most diverse parts are the Northwest cloud forest, the Andean slopes and the Amazon lowlands, which are the areas that we visited. So here's a little uh, closer view of, of the lodges that we used or the locations that we used. We flew into Quito, right there in the middle. Uh, we spent our first night there after we'd flown in. Then we went west for a few nights over here. This is uh, uh, Septimo Perezo, birded that side of the western side of the, of the Andes, went back to Quito for a night, then crossed over the top down to um, San Jacidro for a couple of nights, then farther down to Cota Choca for a night, then up well, northeast here to west or wild Sumaco, back up to Guango here, and then back to Quito. When the when the trip was originally planned, it did not include this oops, this stop in in uh, Cota Choco, and we'll explain why they added that as we get there. So day one, we we went up. Uh, we were trying to get acclimated acclimatized to the altitude. We went to 11,500 feet, Yanacocha Reserve. This is our group. Uh, it was a small group, four customers. That's me on the left and my roommate, Debbie, next to me. The, the fellow behind us is Rob. Rob is the owner of, of uh, Saber Wing Nature Tours. So he was the company man that came along, an excellent burger. Then the couple to the right, the two on the end, that's uh, Polly and Steve, they were from Indiana and the fella in between is our local guide, uh, Edison uh, Buenano, and an excellent guide. He could tell calls and obviously everything that, was, that we needed to know. One of the things that you looked for at Yanacocha, as shown on the picture or on the, the signboard is the uh, say, um, uh, sword build hummingbird, which is down here in the lower right. This hummingbird is pretty incredible. This is the only bird, the bird that has the longest bill compared to its body, or the bill is longer than its body. It has to per when it's perched, it has to perch with its bill pointing up or just to balance. If it's not, it'll topple over. And it has to preen with its feet because it can't preen with its bill, it's too long. It comes to the um, hummingbird feeders and it hovers because it's obviously it can't grasp the feeder and feed with that long bill. So some of the flowers, the nat native flowers that it feeds on are like the flower at the far right, top right, that's a datura flower. Ones that have the long corollas that the, the its bill can, can fit. Now the bird lower in the middle, that is a barred fruit eater. 
when I, when I prepare for a trip, I go through the field guide and look at all the birds that I may possibly see. And this page of, there was a page of birds called the fruit eaters. And I said, why not? I want to see these. So this is, this would be considered one of the target groups that I wanted. And we got this guy the, the very first day, a barred fruit eater. Barring on its chest is why it gets the name. And that cool plant to the left. I have no idea what it was, but it was cool. And I'm, I like plants too. So um, let's see, let's go on. We stopped at Yanacocha and had lunch and we ate at this under this little shelter here you see at the bottom left. Um, and in front is the hummingbird feeders. That's where we saw the sword build coming in. And we also saw this little guy to the left. These are all three of the same hummingbird. This is a um, shining sunbeam. Uh, it's beautiful. Just a kind of a, a brownish, reddish brownish um, hummingbird, but it just sparkles on its back. That purplish shimmery uh, coloring uh, is down the, just down the back of it. It's a little bit of an aggressive hummingbird, uh, the bully of the feeder. It kind of chased everybody else off, but it, it was a showstopper. And then at the same, just to the right of where the hummingbird feeders were, was this fruit feeder. They, and they have a lot of those because there's a lot of fruit eaters in the, in the tropics. And they usually put bananas or papayas or watermelon, whatever fruit they have that they want to put out there. This big guy is an Andean guan. It was the bully of this feeder and it came up and it just helped itself to those bananas. Kind of this, kind of about the size of a pheasant, maybe a little bigger, but very, very good tropical bird. So our first lodging uh, of any length was at Septimo Parezo, which means seventh heaven. We were here for four nights. Uh, when we were birding the western slope of the Andes. This is in near the town of Mindo, which is considered the jungle capital of the area. Wonderful grounds for, for birding. It had, and if you're there for the lodge, it had a lovely pool. It had a chocolatier, of course, on the grounds, which we checked out one afternoon when we needed a break. But across from this entrance was a hummingbird feeding station. Um, most places had these feeding stations because there are a lot of hummingbirds in Ecuador. But this feeding station was uh, laid out in kind of a circular uh, circle. There were seats in the middle and uh, over a dozen feeders were scattered around the circle and they were numbered. So we would sit in the, in the benches or stand with our binoculars or our cameras or whatever and our guide would say oh look at feeding station number six it's got thus and such on it and here are some of the hummingbirds that we saw um top left there well first hummingbirds in ecuador they have approximately 135 different species of hummingbirds 40 percent of the world's hummingbird species, more than any other country. We saw over 60 species. Now, trying to remember those when you got home, it was a good thing we had a checklist to just keep track of what we saw. Some of the ones we did get and that I was fortunate enough to get some pictures of, top left is the brown violet ear. Uh, bottom below him is the green thorn tail, that's a female. Top right, velvet purple coronet. Note that when he, he's got his wings cocked, when they fly up to the feeder, they cock their wings before they bring them down to their body. We'll see another one later that does that as well. And below the coronet is the white-necked Jacobin. Now the feeder in the middle, there's about nine different species there. So they're they're not like our our um, ruby throats, at least up here in Ohio, that chase everybody else away. These guys just bully in and, and uh, start eating. 
couple of the other amazing and beautiful hummingbirds. The, two, the one on the left, this is called the booted racket tail. This is the, the race that you see on the western slope of the Andes. Note the white boots, the white booties on their feet, those little feathers, and that beautiful racket tail. Now, once you go to the eastern slope of the Andes, those boots are orange, and we saw both. That was pretty cool. The two pictures on the left, that's the male. The one in the top right, the little one that's bending over feeding, that's the little female booted racket tail. She does not have the pretty tail, but she's got those little white boots. Behind her is an Empress Brilliant, a female, very stern looking. Uh, and then lower right is the fawn breasted brilliant. Just incredible variety of, of hummingbirds. And this one, this one was a pretty cool. Our, our second day, we were birding and we stopped at uh, Tony and Barbara Nunnery's uh, place to, for our lunch break. They weren't there, but they, they allowed us to come in and bird their little sanctuary, Pacaquindi Sanctuary. And we were sitting under their deck, um, watching their feeders, hummingbird feeders and fruit feeders and having our lunch. And this hummingbird flew up and our guide said, oh, that's a white-tailed hill star, that's female. And didn't think anything of it, but they said, oh yeah, she likes that wooden stick perch where the, where the wood pile is. So about a month after I was home, I follow Julie Zikafus on Facebook. I don't know if any of you know her. She's one of the uh, writers for um, Bird Watchers Digest, um, a fellow Ohioan. Anyway, she was leading a tour in Ecuador and they had stopped at this place as well. And she posted a picture of this hummingbird and put this note that said, wrote this note and I'm gonna read her post. She may not be the most spectacular but this female white-tailed hill star was surely the most distinguished hummingbird we saw. She's been a resident at Tony and Barbara Nunnery's Paca Quindi Sanctuary in the Ecuadorian Andes for 14 years. How do they know? The little white feather in her cap and her penchant for perching in the lumber pile. Gotta love a bird like that. So after I read Julie's post, I ran back, looked at all my pictures, because I knew I'd gotten a picture of this hummingbird. And sure enough, the picture, the lower left picture, you can see that little white feather on her, uh, behind her eye on, on the top of her head. So this, this hummingbird is 14 years old and it has the spot at Tony and, and Barbara Nunnery's place where it, where it feels at home and continues to awe all of us. Now, at the same location, we don't always just look at birds, but under the fruit feeder, out comes this animal that we, none of us, well, none of the, the, uh, the four of us that were customers, I guess, were all amazed to see. And our guide said, oh yeah, that's a Tara. It's of the weasel, it, one of the weasel, a member of the weasel family. It's omnivorous. It's about twice the size of a large house cat. So put that in perspective. This guy was pure muscle. And I don't know if he was eating the grubs that were, that had fallen down underneath eating the fruit or whatever, but he ate for a while, she, he, and we all took lots of pictures and then slipped back off into the, into the woods, into the, the, I guess, yeah. Anyway, that was a very cool thing for us to, to find. So we don't always just look at birds. However, tanagers are rank right up there with the hummingbirds. Um, these are what I would consider the warblers of the tropics. Ecuador has 169 species of tanagers. We saw, just as with the hummingbirds, over or approximately 60 different species of tanagers. Just crazy. They're fruit eaters. So there's lots of uh, places with, with um, 
feed, eating feeding stations where they put there you can see lots of whole bananas out there and these guys just come and you take lots of pictures so top left going right i have we have the black chested mountain tanager the scarlet bellied mountain tanager the blue winged mountain tanager and the swallow tanager the bottom left across is the blue gray tanager golden naped tanager and the black capped tanager just beautiful okay day three we visited ref the refugio paz de la aves um, this is a location that was known for this particular site we got there early we were joined by another tour group uh, beyond our this viewing station up in the trees is a lek site for where the Andean cock of the rocks practice doing the males come and they practice doing their displays and try to attract the females. Was not the most easy way, easy place to get a picture of these birds. So you can't quite see this guy's head, but the feathers on the top of this guy, it, it's like a little pompadour on top of his head. But they were they were performing and displaying and calling. There was a lot of testosterone going around that morning. Um, incidentally, LEC, uh, this is a site where the males come and display for the females. It's from a Swedish word referring to, quote, pleasurable and somewhat unruly activities, unquote. Yes. One of the um, side benefits of this particular spot were these two wood quails that came out the top right black backed wood quails the guides have been feeding them bananas and this pair slowly made their way out took some bananas by hand we all got to take lots of pictures and then off they went so this particular refuge was known for its uh Cock of the Rock Lex site. Um, it's owned by this fella, top left. This is Angel de Paz. He owns and manages this location. He used to be a, a um, woodsman, a tree. He would harvest trees and, and also maintain this, this Lex site. And one day he was walking some birders through and they noticed an ant pitta. Ant pittas are very skulky they're very uh tricky to see and the the, the uh the birder was excited and said oh my gosh you'll get even more birders coming if you can get these birds to come out for uh, viewing so on hell started trying started experimenting how do we attract these birds to come out found tried to feed them all kinds of things and found out that they like worms so he goes and he actually this the bird in the top middle this is a giant ant pitta that's maria not sure if it's a male or a female but all giant ant pittas he calls them maria and he'll sit and he'll whistle and he'll call them benga benga maria maria benga means come in in uh, spanish and out they come and he tosses some worms and we get every all the birders are happy well you get one ant pitta you get another one top right is the mustached ant pitta a little rarer bottom left that's shakira that's the ochre breasted ant pitta they nickname it shakira because it has this little habit of shifting its body like shakira is the I'm assuming you may know the Latin American singer that likes to shake her body around. And so this little, this little bird got nicknamed Shakira. Bottom low, the bottom middle, that is the yellow breasted ant pitta. And bottom right is the chestnut crowned ant pitta. Ant pittas are fascinating. They're very quiet, or they you'll hear them more often than see them. They look like as I used to say, golf balls with legs. There's hardly any tail. They have 
long legs. They're a very vertical uh, bird. They walk. They walk through the understory in the in the rainforest, and they're just super cool to see. So we were thrilled to see this. Ecuador, by the way, has 23 different species of ant pittos. So here we are celebrating. Yay, we went five for five on ant pittos. They were hoping and, and we succeeded. Then Anhel there is in the middle and then his son is, is over my shoulder. So we were all happy, happy, happy burgers. So day five, the next day, we birded an area called in the cloud forest, Mashpi cloud forest area. Uh, cloud forest is a pre-montane subtropical rainforest. The cloud cover is very low, so it really doesn't rain. It drips from the clouds. We went to the Amaguza Reserve. I started the day with 990 life birds. Counted the 10 that we saw, and here's my thousandth. This is one of the, one of the uh, it's in the tanager family. This is the golden collared honey creeper. The male is at the top and the female is, is below. And of course, we had to celebrate with another picture of me hitting my thousandth bird. Let me explain for any of you that are not birders, um, a lifer, birders like to keep lists. We keep, we keep year lists, we keep month lists, we keep yard lists, we keep, keep state lists, we keep county lists, we keep life lists, we keep all kinds of lists. So a life list is like the ultimate list. These, a life bird is the first time you've ever seen that particular bird. Uh, so you go on these trips and you want to find lots of lifers. So this one, and then when you hit a milestone, that's pretty cool too. So hit, finding a, seeing my thousandth lifer was pretty, pretty uh, important day to celebrate, which we, now before I got into birding, I was very much interested in plants and especially ferns. So when I, when I go to these tropical places, I'm easily distracted by vegetation. I know I'm there to see all the birds and I, I, we do, we do, but I always have to throw in some plant pictures too, especially the ferns. So all different variety. And you gotta have some more tanagers. Top left, silver-throated, glistening green, golden. These all kind of make sense. Bottom left, rufous-throated, flame-faced, and moss-backed tanagers. If that guy would turn around, you'd see that his back is kind of a mossy colored. Anyway, like I said earlier, the warblers of the tropics. Gotta love tanagers. One of the other, another bird on my target list, um, again, when I go to a, to a uh, when I'm going to a, a trip on uh, in a tropical place like this or a place I've never been, I always pull out birds that I want to see or that I would like to see. And, and the oil bird was one of them. It's a very unique uh, species. They're nighttime flyers. And so they roost during the day and they roost in caves or in this case, it was more like a little slot canyon. We had to climb these steps and go up to this where this fence is and they were roosting up on the ledges above us. There, um, there were about a dozen up here. They are assigned to their own taxonomic family and they mostly live in South America, subsisting almost entirely on high fat fruits like palm fruits, but they eat them at night when they're, and they fly at night. They are very similar in appearance to our um, insect eating night jars and night hawks, but they eat fruit. Um, anyway, they nest and roost in these deep caves and caverns and they navigate through using echolocation. Very interesting, very interesting birds. And another interesting group of, of birds and family that 
that people like to see are the barbets and the toucans. Again, fruit eaters, they like to come to feeders or they're very loud and boisterous and, and uh, they attract your attention. Top left is the red-headed barbet, the male, the female is next to him. Top right is the toucan barbet. And bottom left is the orange fronted barbet. Bottom right is the crimson rumped toucanette. And on the next page, a few more. The collared arasari is on the top left. There in the middle is the yellow-throated toucan. And top right is golden collared toucanette. The fruit loop birds. All right, day six. We came back the night before, spent a night in, in Quito, and then we headed up high uh, across the Andes. We went to Antisana National Park, about 13,500 feet, and we were searching for Andean condors. The life side, size cutout there that, that I'm over being overpowered by is the Andean condor. It's the largest la uh, flying land bird, land bird being the, the uh, descriptor in the world. It has a wingspan of 10 feet, 10 inches. Fortunately, we saw several. We saw this uh, soaring juvenile right there in the middle. And then later we found three or four that were feeding in a, um, a cattle pasture in amongst some cattle. Good thing we looked twice because the cattle were black and the birds were blending right in. They were eating, feeding on a carcass the rangers in the park will find uh, dead animals and they'll throw them out in the fields for the, for the uh, condors to eat. So again, we, we have to celebrate when we see new things or good things. And here we are celebrating that we'd seen uh, Andean condors. Um, it is the national bird of Ecuador. It's on their, their national seal. And like I said, it's the largest land bird, flying land bird in the world, the king of the Andes. Some of the other birds that we saw at these high elevations, the largest hummingbird. This is the giant hummingbird. It's eight inches long, big guy. The bird on the right is not very exciting. This is the black flower piercer, but it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I like to see birds uh, behaving as they're supposed to be behaving. This is a flower piercer. It pierces the flowers to get at the, uh, the nectar. And so it's feeding on the nectar of this datura flower. It has a little bit of a hook on its bill so it can bite a little hole and then um, drink the, the nectar that's there. Bird on the bottom left, it's not very exciting, but has a cool name. It's the Stout Build Synclodes. Right, so this higher elevation is, is the, where you find what's called paramo. This is 10,000 feet and up. It's a grassland area in Colombia, Northern Ecuador, Western Venezuela. It's the only place that you find paramo. It's very similar to the Alaskan tundra um, in that it acts as a sponge absorbing moisture and releasing it into the um, rivers that, that flow out of this area. So it's considered paramo fed as opposed to our, if you were in um, say Northern Canada or Alaska and you have glacier fed rivers, these are paramo, paramo, paramo fed uh, rivers. Anyway, it's wide open. The views, there's obviously no trees. It's wide open views. Behind us is uh, Mount Antisana, which we saw in the first view, the first uh, picture of my slides. It's a little cloudy there. But also, it was windy, it was cold, and lots of tundra type, or I should say paramo type plants growing. Nothing, nothing that would be broken down by the wind. The other guy in the picture here 
which we haven't, uh, I hadn't mentioned before. That's our driver, the guy in the sunglasses. That's Carlos. He was our driver. So he got in a couple of pictures. Some of the species we saw in this, in this area, top left is the carunculated caracara. Uh, below him is the uh, Andean lapwing, one of their shorebirds, acts a lot like a killdeer. It's not, doesn't necessarily need to be near water, like to be out in the fields. Top right is one of their ibis. This is the black, or it used to be the black-faced. It's now called the Andean ibis. And below that is the many-striped canistero. While we were up there, we ran into a fella that was re doing research on the ibis and had some um, uh, models uh, that he had out trying to attract them. So of course, Edison needed a picture of those with one of those Andean ibis models. Okay, next lodge for the next two nights. This is Cabana San Isidro. Uh, we had a nice common area there, top left, lots of lights, lots of windows. That's where we ate our meals. It was a nice, the nice sitting area where we're enjoying top right there. Our, our lodgings were these little individual cabanas. Um, that's the one that Debbie and I shared. Very nice, just right up the, the hill from the, the dining area. Um, San Isidro is known for this owl, bottom center. It's a mystery owl. Um, it's considered an undescribed form, thought to be either a hybrid, hybrid between a black banded owl and a, white, a black and white owl, but they're, or an aberrant individual. They're not quite sure. Um, so until they make a decision or find another one and they interbreed, then we can't consider this a life bird, but it's on that waiting list until they decide what to do with it. But of course, we, we all went out and, and found it the first night we were there. Some of the non-birding diversity in the tropics is the insect life. Um, they left the lights on at the dining area long enough to attract all kinds of cool moths and butterflies and well moths and bugs overnight and this was just a, a selection of those but the variety was amazing um, ecuador holds 30 percent of the world's natural diversity six like i said 1660 bird species 6,000 butterfly species and 12,000 moth species and that's just what's been identified So San Isidro had an ant pitta station as well. So we got to add another ant pitta. This is the white-bellied ant pitta. Thumbs up. We added one more ant pitta. Yay. And a few more hummingbirds were coming to their feeders. Top left is the crown wood nymph. Top right is the female gorgoted wood star. And remember the cocked wings that we saw earlier. This is another coronet. This is the chestnut breasted coronet. They come to the feeder and before they stop, pull their wings in, they cock them back like that. Just an interesting and uh, cool habit, habit that helps you identify them. Some of the other bird species that we saw around this uh, San Isidro, the collared trogon, is the far left, top middle, scarlet rumped cacique. Far right, uh, top right is the green jay, which we see in, in Texas, the green or the Inca jay. But, uh, if you've been to Texas, you've seen that one. Uh, bottom middle is a southern lapwing. We saw the Andean lapwing earlier. This is the southern lapwing. And bottom right is the russeted backed, russet backed oropendula. You know, the oropendulas build those cool hanging nests that they, uh, uh, pendulous nests that they, they nest in. Okay, more, more pretty plants. Uh, you got to see ferns. I had to throw in some pictures of orchids because why not? Okay, day eight, we went to this area called uh, Guacamaya's Ridge. 
and walk this trail, this Sendero Jumandi Trail. It was about a three mile round trip uh, walk, it took us four and a half hours because we were looking at all kinds of cool things. It was a, a trail that reminded me of hiking in Western North Carolina, but with tropical plants, yeah. Um, when you're when you're birding in a place like this, you're looking for feeding flocks, uh, mixed flocks. Um, birds will band together as they move through the forest, um, going after fruit, going after insects, whatever. Maybe twenty to thirty different species. Safety in numbers. There's somebody looking out. There's a there's one particular species that's like the lead and the the loudest one. They're um, they could be up in the canopy. They could be on the trunk. They could be in the lower branches in the understory. But it's it's typical that you'll find these groups uh, moving through the 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 forest, and it's very challenging for a birder because you'll get the guides will start calling things out and you just don't know where to look. So it can be a little overwhelming, but um, that's what you do in the tropics. One of the family of uh, groups of birds that we um, mainly heard were tapaculus. Tapaculus are a very vocal uh, species. Most of them are dull gray. They're not very exciting to, to look at, except for this one top right. This is the oscillated tapaculu. This is not my picture. The, the, the look we got was just a really good glimpse through a bunch of vegetation, but it was a beautiful bird and we um, were thrilled to see that one. Again, there were, we had six species of tapaculus and four we only heard, which is not unusual. And surprise, surprise, we found another ant pitta, bottom, bottom right. This is the undulated ant pitta. Decided it was a young bird because it was not, it had a, no care in the world that we were there and it, it led us down a tra the trail that we were on for a quarter mile half a mile we just took our time and just watched it was feeding and got lots of pictures of it so that was that was a uh, a bonus one of the other groups of birds we see in the tropics are the quetzals there are three species here top left is the golden headed bottom the middle is the pavanine and top right is the crested quetzal this trail that we just walked we saw the two top ones, and then the bottom one we saw later when we were in the Amazonia. So that afternoon, after we'd done the morning uh, mountain uh, walk, we made it down to the edge of, Ab of the Amazon. This is um, near the this lagoon, Paquita Lagoon. We took this ride, this boat trip, which was more like a winding canal, if, if I would describe it. But you can see we've shed all of our warm clothes. It's pretty hot down here. Pedro is pulling us along, or will be pulling us along. He's one of the local guys. And just some of the things we saw, black um, spider monkey there in the middle, top middle. Far right is the saddle-backed tamarind, and middle, lower middle is the striated heron, a juvenile. So like I said, we look at things other than birds when we're here. One of my main target birds is this odd looking thing on the left. This is a Watson. Watson, we saw, oh, about half a dozen of these. They are prehistoric looking. They are crazy. They've got this wild crest. They've got a blue face like a cassowary and the body of a chicken, not to mention the digestive system of a cow. This single member of its family still baffles taxonomists regarding its evolution. They nest over water and their young, when they're born, have claws on their wings. So if something should threaten it, they drop into the water, and then they use their claws when it's safe to climb back up into their nest. Just crazy. Bird on the top right 
is another life bird for me. It was another life bird. That's the sun grebe. So, and yes, another selfie. Smile. Night. We just. This was the night. This was the lodge that was added to the trip. Uh, about two weeks before we left, and you'll see why shortly. This is Kotachoka Lodge. It was pretty rustic. The we were we just overlooked the Napa River. The Napo River, which is a tributary to the to the Amazon, uh, there was no electricity in the in our rooms. There was hot and cold water, and at night they brought us a uh, kerosene lantern, some sort of lantern that burnt all night. So we had light, but just not any electricity. Open air dining area, um, just and very cool, very rustic looking. Trop, um, Amazonian looking. So we got up early. We left the lodge at four, took a two hour drive. Two thirds of it was on gravel rocky road. I was thinking we could snooze in the van, but no luck. We hiked into this rustic open air lodge for breakfast, had a group of indigenous women and children come to see us and try to sell their crafts. Then we had a two hour, about a two mile hike in and through the rainforest and then up to this small viewing area, this little window on the top right picture. Um, and I'll tell you later what we saw there. Anyway, we, we get there, we spent two and a half hours looking through this viewing window and then we had a two hour hike out. It was a long day. Um, like I said, it was hot. We were all drenched. Pedro there in the middle looks as fresh as a daisy. I don't think he sweated a bit and he's wearing wool. Anyway, it was hot, humid, lots of fungus. The, on an aside, the plant there in the middle, this is a strangler fig. Strangler fig, this, the, tree, the, the growth on the right is squeezing and eventually killing the tree on the left. Strangler figs are very important. They, their seed gets lodged in the canopy of a tree, a host tree, and the tree sends down roots, which then forms a trunk and they uh, latch onto the tree that their host tree and they essentially grow around it and squeeze it to death. But the strangler figs are serve as the rainforest grocery store for those that feast on it, including thousands of birds. It's a very beneficial uh, part of the rainforest as far as food or natural food sources for uh, the native uh, wildlife. So this little window here on the right, we get there and there's this group of Asian photographers and they had hired porters to bring their cameras up and set up their cameras and we were trying to find space around them. And why were we there? We walked up here to see the harpy eagle. There was a harpy eagle's nest about a quarter of a mile across the valley on the, in this tree. And we didn't see an adult, which was fine. We had this great view of this, uh, this youngster, probably about four or five months old. It was sitting in the nest when we got there, kind of shaking its head around, its feathers, playing with those long feathers like, like a teenager would do. Then it kind of stood up and it moved around a little bit. And uh, we all oohed and awed and took pictures. And it was very impressive. We were waiting for an adult to come. I guess there was an adult there when the, when the Asian group first got there, but they didn't have any of their cameras equipment out. So they missed the picture. But the adults will, they're hunters of monkeys and sloths, and they can pick these uh, animals out of the treetops as they're flying. They're just super strong. Harpy eagles are declining. So finding this nest was, was uh, very, um, very incredible for us because um, they are hard to find. They're not the largest tropical eagle. Their wingspan is seven feet wide, but they're the most powerful with the strong, strongest grip in their talons. They have about a seven inch spread on their talons. 
anyway, we watched this fella for a while and then all the cameras whirred when it practiced its wings. Didn't go anywhere, but boy, was it impressive with, with those when it spread its wings. I've got to thank my friend Debbie for this picture because I was too busy looking at it through my camp through my binoculars to take a picture. But boy, was it, it was pretty cool. And this is just a youngster. So a few of the other highlights while we were up viewing or on our way down from viewing the, the eagle. There's a Rufus Potu to the left. There in the middle is another hummingbird. That's the fiery topaz. And one of the, the, one of the woodpeckers. This is the cream colored woodpecker. This is a female, which we saw while we were there. All right. Kind of all snoozed in the van and got to our next lodging. This is Wild Sumaco Lodge. It's about a 10 year old um, lodge. The top left is a picture of the dining area and the the uh, deck overlooking the valley. Um, Mount Antasana is way out along the horizon there. Our, our rooms were in a separate building off to the, to the side. And we added another tanager while we were there. Bottom right, this is the Paradise Tanager. What a showstopper. Oh, man. And they had a hummingbird feeding station as well. So some of the hummingbirds we saw, white-bellied wood star, top left, that's a little female feeding on the vervain flowers. They really like those flowers. Black-throated mango is in the middle, female. Top right, wire-crested thorntail. Bottom right, Gould's jewel front. Just amazing variety. And of course, I wasn't there to look for insects, but we saw some cool insects too. Butterflies, dragonflies, damselflies, and some pretty interesting grasshoppers. So when we left Wild Sumaco, we spent one night at Guango Lodge. It's a very quaint chateau style stone lodge. Uh, the common area, the dining area was on the, the ground floor, the upper floor were the rooms that were very unique, that rounded, rounded roof. Every night we would gather, here we are uh, with our checklist. The, uh, we, we came with a checklist and every night we'd go through and mark what we had seen for the day and what our favorite bird was for the day. And here we are toasting our success for the day with a, the complimentary drink of the lodge. Some of the birds we saw around the Guango area. Here's a turquoise jay, top left. Top right is a slaty-backed chat tyrant. This is one of the many tropical flycatchers in Ecuador. Ecuador has 210 flycatchers. So, and I, I didn't count how many we saw, but we saw a lot. And there were a lot to see. Bottom left is the coppery chested jacamar. And the lower right is simply a cool uh, cloud forest tree that's just full of bromeliads. And you had to look at those trees because there were always birds in there looking for bugs. But very cool. All right, one of the ducks that we searched for, uh, it's the torrent duck. Early on the trip, we found an this lovely little female bottom left. Torrent ducks live in fast moving rivers. They're not much of a flyer, but they're a great swimmer and they feed underwater on the vegetation that's on the rocks. Um, we found this, like I said, we found this earlier female and then at this, this is the Papalacta River near Guango, we did find a, a male. We'll see that, we'll see him next. Um, but if you're familiar with American dippers, the bottom picture is, a, is one of the dippers. That's the white cap dipper, also likes the fast moving water. So here's the male, stunning, stunning male. This is the torrent duck. 
And while we were there, the, the bottom left picture, he was very attentive to his female and keeping an eye on her and watching her as she fed ravenously. Um, after my trip, I followed the Guango Lodge on Facebook and they eventually posted this lovely picture of the family. So they obviously nested and, and successfully raised or successfully hatched a couple of young. All right, our last day of birding, we went high, 14,400 feet. We went up to the Papalakta Pass in the Kayambe Coco Reserve, stunning views. Thin air, you had to be careful, very remote. Again, tundra type vegetation, very windy, very cold, treacherous walking, slow going. Why do you go there? because we were searching for this. The rufous-bellied seed snipe. It's about the size of a football. They don't fly much, but they walk on the ground feeding on these, these um, tundra-like flowers. And we saw two, so our success in seeing this bird. But you have to go way up high to find them. They're not a lower elevation bird. So on our drive back down, to Quito, we had heard that there was a bear. Uh, and so we stopped, it was quite a ways away. This is the only native bear in South America. This is the spectacled bear. And it was feeding on this bromeliad uh, plant that was way over on the far bank. So my camera was stretched to get any kind of picture, very artistic looking picture. Okay, so how did we do? My totals, my trip totals, I had 542 trip birds, 405 of those were lifers, 65 are herd only. I do keep track of that because there are a number of species that you may never see. You may hear them and I may never get back there again. So I have noted this in my lists that these are ones that I've only heard. Um, I must say that I just got back from a couple of weeks ago, I got back from Costa Rica and Five of my herd only birds have now graduated into the scene category. So at some point, if I ever return, I will try to focus on seeing some of the ones that I've only heard. And the final um, butterfly to look at, this is 88 and 89 butterflies. Of course, if you Google that, you'll find them. They're pretty, pretty cool. And one last hummingbird. This is the violet-tailed sylph. So thank you very much to Orange Audubon and Orange Audubon Society, Saberwing Nature Tours and the photos that I've used from Debbie and Ellison. So let me now. That was amazing. That was yeah, thank you. Thank you. Fantastic, wow. Um, go just back, how do, I, how do I get back to you guys? Um, just hit stop share, should be something red. Oh, stop share. Look at there that. There you go. Okay. I'll back. <laughs> Good. So now we can have any kind of questions. I'm you willing to. Questions. So Excellent. The, the first question was that first hummingbird with the really long bill. Um, there was a Sword question. Build. What was the purpose of that bill? Like, why was it so long? Huh. <laughs> I wish I knew. I'm I guess to feed those on those long, long tubular flowers, maybe those long tubular flowers, right? Something has to feed on them. So you wonder there are hummingbirds with curved bills. There's hummingbirds and, and the curved bill hummingbirds feed on the flowers that have curved corollas. So this is to feed on the, the, the plants or the flowers with the long corolla. I, this is the best that I can say. And then there was another question that said, what is the purpose of the booties on the hummingbirds? Yeah, I, <laughs> decoration, <laughs> question, right? decoration, why do they have those fancy tails? I don't know, just the variety and tails. the diversity is, yeah. is just incredible. Now, but, your photos are great. Um, did you take all the photos? And no. No, okay. I did see you did. No, I, I took I took the bulk of them. 
but uh, my my roommate Debbie had a much nicer camera, and she took the picture. Well, I know for sure the picture of the eagle, the eaglet with its wings extended. That was her picture, and then I I borrowed a handful of pictures from Edison, our guide. Mm -hmm. What camera do you use? I have a uh, Canon PowerShot um, 60. It's a super zoom. It's nothing fancy. Um, all in one. Yeah. That's okay. I use the same. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, you know the camera. Yeah. Um, Margaret said amazing presentation. She loved that the background information on the beginning on Ecuador. But she did want to know what was the name of that bird that had the claws on the wings to climb back up into the tree again? That was the Watson, H-O-A-T-Z-I-N. If you Google those, you can find some pretty good like nature shows about Watsons. They're just, they're just weird. They're just cool. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. And now I have a question for you. Um, oh, actually... Did you have any problem with attitude sickness? Altitude. Altitude. Um, I say attitude? The first, yeah. yeah, the first day you had to, we kind of took our time. We, we breathed deeply. We drank a lot of water. You, you couldn't go down and come up very quickly because you'd get lightheaded. So you, the first day we, we kind of adjusted and then we were fine. Any dangerous You situation? could feel it. I said you could feel that the oh. al the altitude was different. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but but it you quickly adjusted to it. It was no problem. Good. What about any dangerous situations? Um, not dangerous. But when we went in to get the uh, harpy eagle, it was it was grueling. Um, it was a little more of a walk than we were we thought now i'm a i'm a cyclist so i did fine but i was sore the next day but we had other you know come up a couple of our other people needed help because some of the walking was was rougher than we thought um and, and then when we were up looking for the seed snipe that was uh pretty you know we were on these paths that were pretty narrow and and a little tricky so but no, no dangerous situations, no accidents or anything like that. No snakes, bugs, or illnesses? Nope. 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 I, I think it was too cold for insects. <laughs> I don't remember in, insects being a, an issue at all. And I don't, we might have seen some snakes, but I don't remember snakes being high in, in you know, usually I throw in pictures of snakes if I see them, but I don't remember seeing one there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How far up, um, someone asked, did you walk up the elevation of 14,000 14, feet? I mean, how far? We drove up to 14,000 feet. It, there was a radio tower there, um, radio towers. And so we drove up to the top and then we walked around a little bit maybe a little higher than that, but we mainly drove up there and then walked around looking for the seed snipe. Uh, then we did have Bradley, Jake Kane did say that the swordbill hummingbird evolved um, together with that long orange flower. Um, the Datura flower, yeah. Yeah, that you Very showed good. with the flower piercer. And it's the only right. hummingbird species that can reach the nectar at the base of that flower. There you go. Yep, those long Corollas, yep. Yeah. And let me see. Yes, the long Corollas, and that's pretty much what the next person had mentioned. They looked it up on Wikipedia too, so. Excellent, good, Very good. yay. Very good. Um, Great. So I have a question, how many lifers do you have right now? Um, 13, 40, something like that. Nice. Very nice. I just, I think I mentioned I went to Costa Rica recently and I only mm -hmm. added a hundred there. There was a lot of overlap from Panama and a lot of, a lot of our migrants. So that's okay. That's okay. That's cool. 
And then just real quick, how would you contrast um, hiring, taking a tour versus hiring a guide? Well, I just, my Costa Rica trip, we hired a guide and there were two of us plus the guide. Um, the Ecuador and the Panama trip were both group trips, but they were small groups. We had four people. Um, I, I granted with the, our own private guide, we got to see a lot of stuff, but, um, and you didn't have to wait for slow people, you know, it was, everybody was, you know, we were, we were all there together. Um, I think if I, I would not probably go with a big group because I'm spoiled. I like the smaller groups and uh, a private guide was pretty darn cool. <laughs> so yeah, it, again, it's, it's, it was a little more money maybe, but not significantly more uh, for the, for the private guide, but it was, it was, uh, worthwhile. Very good. Well, that was actually very wonderful. Pretty exciting. Now we all cool. have a list of where to go. Oh yeah. You got to go to Ecuador. You yeah. have to go to Ecuador. Did you yeah. get Mark? And that was, we were just in the Northern, the Northern part. So, you know, I, I should return and do the Southern part now, but Again, as we said earlier, it's all time and money. So, yeah. And Deborah, yep. did you have a question? Well, just uh, did you uh, answer Margaret's question about no illness from food? Oh yeah, I think we did. No illness. Yeah, no, I had. Right, right. Too cold for you, both. You have to be. You have to be careful. Of course, you have to make sure that everything is bottled and try not to forget. Yeah. But no, I was, we were all fine food wise. Oh, I did see pack your, did. pack your Tums and your Imodium just in case. <laughs> oh, did you need to get any specific shots for the trip? I think I got one of the hepatitis shots, hepatitis A maybe. Um, I don't think you needed anything else. I know when I went to Panama, I took malaria pills just to be safe because it's buggier in Panama. But Ecuador, I don't, I, I, other than, like I said, the, the hepatitis A, I think is what I got. Okay. Um, and I didn't need anything for Costa Rica. I had to have vaccinated for COVID, which was no problem. And then I had to get a, a test to come home. You had to have a negative COVID test to come home, but yeah. That was good. How do you know what yep. is the best time of year to go? Like to Costa Rica would. Well, I uh, look to see when the tour groups are going. Um, although we, we knew we wanted to go in the fall, which is considered their low season kind of because uh, it's rainy, partial, partly rainy and, and, that's how I, Panama was supposedly the rainy season. We had a few rainy afternoons for an hour maybe, but um, I had no experience where the rain was a problem. So, yeah. and if it was rainy, we, we jumped in the van and we went out looking for birds because we were in the van. We didn't just <laughs> sit, sit around and twiddle our thumbs. So you still went and did stuff. Very good, very good. All right, any other Great. questions? Great, that's it, we really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Good, well, thanks, yeah. thanks. This was, it was fun. It was, I hope I didn't go too late, too over, eh, probably. Oh, but. no, no. <laughs> okay. so, All right, I'm gonna stop the recording.